Guys, let's get started. Uh, welcome to today's scan seminar presentation, and uh, for today we are continuing with, uh, you know, presenting the uh, TRP presentations, paper presentations given uh, back in January, and uh, one of those for today is actually a little bit of an expanded version of the presentation that was also given by. Uh, Isam Gamia, uh, back at TRB time, a presentation related to a project that was uh, conducted here uh, as part of uh, the ICT studies. This is 1-24, 124 uh, project, which was on actually the, ad, uh, the large size, basically uh, aggregate subgrade materials built in a uh, series of test sections in the field and tested with the Atlas uh, test machine for adequacy in building actually very soft subject conditions. That was actually a project that Hassan Kazmi is about to defend and uh, get his PhD on this, but because he took a job, already left, and uh, that's why actually Isam did a good job as he's doing the follow-up study on the same uh, experimental series here. So he was able to present this, so he's going ahead with presenting also today's seminar, just like he did at TRB. But a little bit of an expanded version of this. One good thing about this presentation is that this presentation talks about various uh, QA, QC procedures related to building the foundations of pavements. And that's why there's a lot of information that we ended up using uh, in, the, in, the, in the field, uh, these different devices to check on the construction quality. So uh, with that, I would like to actually uh, let Isam to start, but just to mention that he's doing the continuation project, as I mentioned. In addition to the large aggregates, he's putting uh, quarry byproducts into his uh, test sections. And uh, he's been with us since 2014. He is a PhD student, already doing a great job in the follow-up study. So. I know there's a lot of details in these slides, but he always does a good job finishing on time going through all of this. <laughs> Without further ado, I'll let Isam take the lead. All right. Sure. Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Kent Seminar. Uh, as Professor Tutumel already mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about the adequacy of uh, quality control and quality assurance techniques that are used for evaluating constructed aggregate layers for working platform and flexible pavement uh, purposes uh, in the field or in place. Uh, as also Professor already mentioned, this is uh, related to a project at ICT here, the R27-124 uh, research project, which is mainly about the evaluation of aggregate subgrade materials used as payment subgrade granular subgrades. And what we mean by aggregate subgrade materials, these are large sized rocks that can be up to 6 inches or 8 inches, top size materials that are being uh, used uh, on top of uh, weak subgrade 
for remedial uh, purposes. And these can be uh, either virgin aggregates or they can be recycled materials such as recycled concrete aggregates or uh, reclaimed asphalt pavements or a combination of uh, materials. So the objectives of this project in general were uh, first of all to develop some characterization techniques for these uh, large size uh, top aggregate materials mainly in the lab uh, to get the source composition, the particle size and particle shape properties in which we use two of our equipment here in the lab, uh, the aggregate uh, image analyzer for the shape characterization and the large scale triaxial test to do uh, the shear test uh, uh, for the shear properties of these materials. Uh, the other objective is uh, following the uh, lab characterization of these materials to evaluate the field performance through accelerated full scale pavement testing for both unsurfaced working platforms as well as asphalt paved uh, low volume road uh, uh, applications. Uh, once those uh, field and lab evaluations are done, uh, the uh, other objective is to revise and develop some material specifications for the use of these materials and to evaluate the adequacy of the current design framework that are used uh, in the design right now, uh, their adequacy to the new uh, top sized uh, materials. Uh, to start with, uh, I'm going to just demonstrate the IDOT subgrid stability requirements, which are the stability requirements for IDOT uh, for uh, different soils and different uh, soil strength here in Illinois. Uh, so basically what IDOT requires is if the in-situ soils has a CBR of 8% of or higher, this uh, subgrade soil is good uh, to build or construct pavements on top. If the CBR is between 8 and 6% or 6 to 8%, then some uh, remedial procedures might be optional. But if the CBR is less than 6, then this road is not adequate for the construction of pavements on top of it, and um, some remedial actions will be required. Depending on whether geogrids and geotextiles are used or just aggregate covers are used, and depending on the CBR value of the in-situ subgrade, then uh, the aggregate uh, uh, cover uh, that is required on top of the subgrade is different. So for example, if we have a very weak soft soil with a CBR1, there's a requirement of around uh, 23 inches of uh, uh, aggregate thickness to be put on top of the subgrade in order to construct pavement on top of that. If we have a CBR of three, for example, then around 12 inches will be sufficient. In addition to these requirements for thicknesses, there's also a requirement for uh, density. So these uh, should achieve a uh, dry density of 95% from the standard uh, pr uh, compactive effort or the proctor density that is uh, measured in the lab. And these are mainly layers just to improve the subgrade application and they're not considered a pavement layer from the pavement structure of the constructed layers on top. So these are the requirements for Illinois for the construction. And uh, some other uh, Illinois practices uh, that are uh, currently approved is that uh, the IDOT is moving uh, from smaller, uh, for the purposes of uh, remediation of subgrade, from the smaller uh, aggregate gradations, such as the gradations bands that they have the CA6 and the CA2 right now, which, for example, for the CA6, the top aggregate size is one and a half inch. Uh, they have a 4 to 12 percent uh, fines content, or the CA2, which has a little bit uh, larger top aggregate size, two and a half inches, but is also have a fine gradation. And they are now shifting to larger aggregates uh, for the purposes of subgrade remediation, with gradation bands named as the CSO1, CSO2, and RRO1. So RR is actually a railroad uh, similar gr uh, size gradation, three inches top size while the CSO2 can be up to a six inches size aggregate with little fines, and the CSO1 can be as large as eight inches in the top size. So now IDOT is permitting the use of these large aggregates for the construction of uh, 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 construction platforms in the field, and uh, the idea of this study is to evaluate the use. Uh, talking about the materials that we, or that were used in this project by uh, Hassan and the research team, uh, there were uh, five different aggregate subgrade materials that were used. Uh, uh, we will refer to them in this presentation as type A through type E. And if you look at these materials, they have different target gradations uh, 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 of RR01, CSO1, CSO2, and uh, CS6. And they also are different materials. So uh, two of the materials are uh, virgin materials, type A and type C. Type A is just a virgin material with a railway ballast size. And type C is a primary crusher run aggregate with a top size of six inches, so the large rocks. Uh, while other materials are recycled materials, type B is crushed concrete. Type D is a blend of uh, crushed concrete and uh, recycled or reclaimed asphalt pavement, so 60% concrete, 40% wrap. And then uh, type E is a coarse fractionated wrap uh, material. 
And then there's another material that is used, uh, which is type F. This is not an aggregate subgrade material. It's a large top size base coarse uh, virgin aggregate material. And from those seven materials, two materials are used as capping materials on top of the large aggregate, which are the type E and the type G. So type E is a coarse fractionated wrap material, while type G is just regular dolomite <coughs> base coarse material that is commonly used at the state of Illinois. Uh, just to give you an idea about the pictures and the sizes, uh, uh, these are different materials that will be used. Uh, each picture here has a calibration ball. Probably it's uh, more clear here. So this is a one inch ball and you can see how large these rocks are. So, and uh, they vary from just virgin aggregates such as type C and type A here to recycled materials such as this recycled concrete material and uh, wrap blend with uh, concrete. Uh, this is the top size, large top size version material, and these are the two capping materials that will be used, the wrap and the uh, typical uh, dolomite material. Showing the gradations of the different materials, you see that the gradations vary from some uniformly graded materials, such as the two version aggregates, the type A and type C. Type A has the highest top size of six inches, and then type C here. And uh, other materials are more well graded, uh, such as the recycled materials. The finest material is the uh, regular uh, base coarse material, the dolomite material, which is the type uh, G material with 10% uh, finest content. Um, one thing to notice here is that uh, the uh, empty symbols are for the virgin materials, the solid symbols are for the recycled materials. Materials A through D are uh, large size aggregate materials and their main there are regular size materials. And for materials B, uh, D, and E, uh, shown here, the percentage of wrap was varied from 0%, so p type D is just 100% crushed concrete, type D is a blend of concrete and wrap, and then type E is wrap. And we're going to compare these, the performance of these three sections. So as I mentioned before, uh, for the first objective was to characterize those materials in the lab. Uh, uh, one of the characterization technique was the aggregate shape properties. Uh, and for that, the uh, aggregate image analyzer, which is a device that we have here in Atrial, was used. Uh, this material is capable of taking different shots of the aggregate from different uh, views, top and uh, two sides, and then generate uh, the 3D images to get some uh, properties of the shape. Uh, mainly the angularity index, the surface texture, and uh, the flat and elongated ratio. And uh, basically what these are, the angularity is uh, basically the, the sharpness of the material, on the, uh, the aggress on a macro scale. The surface texture is more onto the micro scale and then the flat and elongated ratio is basically the ratio of the largest diameter to the, uh, the largest dimension to the smallest dimension of one aggregate size. And the importance of this is that the shear properties of the material actually vary with different uh, shape properties. For example, if the angularity changes or increases uh, going from gravel, which is rounded material, into a crushed, uh, uh, like ha good quality crushed uh, stone aggregate, the friction angle will uh, increase uh, significantly, for example, showing better shear uh, properties. Uh, so this uh, machine here we use for aggregates up to uh, three inches in size and retained on number four. Because some of the materials were larger, as I mentioned, up to six or eight inches in size, then uh, some field imaging techniques using the same routines were used uh, to uh, get the shape properties of these materials that are above three inches in size. And this is basically by putting those large rocks uh, on a mat, taking pictures of them, doing the grayscaling and the thresholding, and then uh, calculating these properties. Uh, showing a summary of the results for the uh, different uh, uh, shape properties of the materials. So here we're showing the flat and elongated ratio, for example, and this is the percentile rank. So just like we can get a gradation curve for the materials, we can also get a percentile rank of the different shape properties uh, by uh, getting the uh, shape properties for different aggregate sizes and making a percentile rank for different ranges of materials. So as you can see here, um, uh, the material that had the most flat and elongated ratio was the dolomite material, the capping material, while the material that has the lowest flat and elongated ratio were uh, uh, the CSO2 material here, uh, the type C material, which is um, the large rock primary crush and run virgin material. This is another similar curve showing the angularity index, and from this curve you can see that the most angular material was the uh, dolomite material, the CA6 material, had the highest angularity index value, while the material that was most mostly rounded 
or more rounded was the uh, type E material, which is the wrap uh, cap and had the lowest angularity index. Similarly, for surface texture, uh, also the dolomite capping material had the highest uh, surface texture, while the wrap material and the primary mm -hmm. crush and run large aggregates had the lowest uh, surface texture from all materials. Another uh, lab evaluation technique other than the shape properties and the gradation was the triaxial uh, tests or the shear test to get the shear properties of those materials. And this is, uh, so we have two setups here at Atrial. We have a setup that we call, nail, uh, call the TX12, to, uh, which is the uh, standard sample uh, of a shear test, the six inches diameter by 12 inches height. And then we have another uh, setup called the TX24, which is for the large size aggregates. It is basically a 12 inch diameter and 24 inches height material. So for the uh, small materials such as the capping layers, the uh, gradations that have a top size of one, one and a half inch, uh, we use the uh, regular standard size, the six inch by 12 inch, 1% strain per minute and get the shear properties. As you see here at different confining pressures, which can be uh, further used to get the more column envelope, the friction angle and the cohesion or the apparent cohesion of these materials to get their shear properties. Uh, for the large aggregates on the other side, uh, especially like the types that have top aggregate sizes up to three inches, uh, we were able to get the shear properties of those materials, or uh, the researchers were able to do that uh, using the TX24 uh, setup, which has a 12 inch diameter, 24 inch height samples, uh, and uh, also I think 1% uh, strain uh, rate per minute. And these are just some typical results for type A material, which is the railroad uh, uh, gradation uh, virgin material and if you see all these uh, uh, changes here or irregularities are because those materials are uh, uniformly graded so they uh, tend to reorient the particles tend to reorient during a shear test while for a more well graded material you would see uh, more uh, uniform uh, curves so after the lab evaluation is the field study, which is the main study for this project. And um, the field study uh, was done by constructing three different cells. By each cell, we mean uh, a location for our accelerated pavement tester. So each cell will have four different sections. And each uh, section here will have two different materials. So the idea of this study is to evaluate the same material with two different cappings, which is the dolomite capping and the wrap capping. So what will happen in each section here is that we will have one, two sections with the same material but different cappings. So um, le let's say uh, we talk about the primary crush and run aggregate. We will have two sections here with the same thicknesses, but the, the materials will be capped by wrap and by dolomite. And then that's another material here with uh, two different cappings. So in total, uh, each cell will have two different materials, uh, four different cappings, uh, totaling four sections. With three cells, we'll have 12 different sections. The north side of these sections will be construction platforms, so unpaved sections, while the south side will be the exact same materials, but they will be paved with four inches of HMA uh, so that they uh, simulate uh, low volume road applications. So uh, what this means in total is that we have uh, 12 different pavement uh, combinations for construction platforms and 12 uh, applications or uh, combinations for low volume uh, road applications. Here's a better summary of the different uh, materials and the different tests. So uh, as you see, um, cell 1 and 2 will have a CBR1, while cell 3 will be a CBR3, engineered uh, soil uh, CBR. Then the material types, usually the larger uh, uh, aggregates are more adequate to be used with the softer CBR. So the materials that have the large top size up to 6 inches will be used on the CBR1 soil. Type A material, uh, the railroad virgin material, and type C, the primary crush and run virgin material, and then type B and D are the crushed concrete and the 40% uh, wrap, 60% blend of uh, wrap and concrete. Uh, those will be built on the CBR1, and each uh, material will have two alternate cappings, so a dolomite capping and uh, wrap capping. So the capping will be three inches. The material themselves will be 21 inches uh, height, and uh, And uh, for the HMA sections, there will be four inches of HMA on top of those uh, materials. For uh, uh, CBR3 or cell 3, uh, two materials were used, which are the wrap and then material F, which is the larger top size aggregate material. The same thing, a three inch capping. But then uh, 
the um, depth of the material will be uh, nine inches only, so nine inches and three inches of capping, because those are on CBR3, as we saw from the requirements of the subgrade stability uh, manual. So to summarize this again on this graph, so here we have the construction platforms. For the construction platforms, for CBR1, we have uh, the four different types of aggregate, 21 inches material and three inches of capping, alternated between a dolomite capping and the wrap capping. For the HMA paved sections, in addition to these, we have another uh, three more inches of the capping material, which is making this as a total of six inches of uh, subgrade, uh, sorry, sub-base material, and then uh, four inches of HMA uh, surfacing. For the CBR3 material, uh, it's the same uh, thing, but the um, uh, depth of the material or the thickness of the material is nine inches and three inches of capping for the uh, construction platforms and for the HMA materials it's an, uh, an additional three inches of uh, capping material and then the HMA surfacing. Going through the different uh, steps for the construction, uh, the first thing it was to engineer the subgrade or the existing subgrade to the target CVR values or the immediate bearing val uh, value uh, uh, values and this was done by moisture adjustment so for uh, our soil here in the atrial we have a correlation between CBR and uh, moisture content, so that we know that uh, for our soil, uh, this soil, 1% uh, CBR corresponds to a 15% target moisture content, while 3% uh, CBR is a 12% moisture content. So this is an iterative process where we add moisture, till the soil, uh, roll it, and measure um, the uh, con, uh, sorry, the penetration with the DCP a dynamic cone penetrometer, and then correlate the DCP results to a CBR by uh, the Klein equation, which is a well-established correlation between DCP and CBR. Uh, just showing some results uh, for cell three for the uh, achieved uh, CBR values. So the target is a CBR of three, and you can see that in many of the sections, this was achieved or slightly lower CBR for the uh, depth is up to 10 inches or more inside the in-situ subgrade. For uh, cells one and two, which were uh, CBR1, this value uh, was also achieved uh, for these two cells. Showing some uh, pictures for uh, the construction uh, uh, procedures and practices. So this is, for example, the soil compaction for a CBR1, which is really tough to do because of the sinkage of the equipment in that very weak CBR material. Uh, placement of the granular layers. So the granular layers were placed and then they were compacted. Uh, on top of these, then the capping layers were added, alternated between a dolomite capping and the wrap capping. Some QA, QC techniques used uh, underneath or on top of the pavement is, uh, for example, putting some aluminum foil uh, for uh, taking uh, ground penetrating radar uh, readers uh, later on and see the um, layer thicknesses that were achieved during the construction and how those changed after the trafficking uh, and which layers rotted the most. Other construction quality control um, uh, uh, techniques that were used were using the nuclear gauge uh, for checking the density of uh, the subgrade soil and of the aggregate layers that were uh, built on top and the HMA. Also the lightweight deflectometer which is a lighter, much lighter version of the falling weight deflectometer uh, mm -hmm. to measure the in-situ stiffness for uh, the soil and the aggregate uh, layers or the base layers as well as the geo gauge which also is another uh, technique used for measuring the stiffness of the soil. So we have uh, density measurement and then two stiffness uh, measurements to be <coughs> compared, as well as the GPR, uh, which will be used uh, later on to get the actual uh, layer thicknesses. So uh, moving to more details about the compaction uh, of the materials and uh, how that was achieved in the field and how it compared to the lab. Uh, we will now focus more on the uh, construction platforms and on the um, densities that were achieved for the capping layers on top of the aggregate subgrade materials. So this uh, top uh, left graph shows the compaction characteristics curves or the moisture density curves uh, for the two materials, the dolomite capping here on top and then the wrap material at the bottom as done in the lab with a standard proctor uh, uh, or standard compactive effort uh, method. So as you can see, the dolomite uh, material has a higher maximum dry density and the higher optimum moisture content, which is expected. Then uh, after we have those uh, uh, curves established in the lab, then uh, this is the achieved values from the field uh, using the nuclear gauge. Uh, so this box plot here on the left shows the dolomite uh, capping uh, densities 
and then this one on the right here is for the wrap material. These two lines here, the solid line on the top, is for the target width density as it should be from uh, the lab for 100% uh, degree of compaction. And then this uh, dotted line here is for the wrap. So what you can see is that uh, for the construction platforms for the compaction, uh, the densities that were achieved for the dolomite were higher than the wrap, but still the relative density in comparison was higher for the wrap than for the dolomite because uh, the achieved density is closer to the target than for the dolomite. So after those results were obtained and uh, those materials didn't achieve the 95% minimum density that is required, uh, there was a, a compaction uh, study uh, that was done on the side, uh, which is a compaction growth curve by increasing the number of roller passes from uh, six passes to 24 passes in increments of six. Uh, to get a compaction curve and see uh, which uh, compactive effort can give us the maximized density. So it was de determined for the dolomite um, capping material that 18 roller passes actually maximize the density. And for the construction of the pavement sections, uh, this was uh, done for both the dolomite and the uh, wrap uh, capping materials, 18 roller passes instead of 12, as was uh, shown in uh, uh, part B here. So with 18 roller passes uh, on both the dolomite and the uh, wrap uh, capping materials, what you can see is actually the, uh, um, the density or the dry density that was achieved uh, for the dolomite material was higher than before, uh, and uh, the rate of compaction was uh, higher. While for the wrap, the increase in the compactive effort wasn't that significant. Uh, even though the variability was less, the average was uh, about the same. So um, the reason of these low uh, compaction densities, which do not achieve the 95% requirement, was mainly because of the drive optimum condition uh, for those aggregate materials for the compaction, as well as the platform at which those aggregates are being compacted, which are the large aggregates that uh, are not uh, probably uh, providing uh, very good support for getting a high uh, compactive, uh, relative compaction mm -hmm. effort. Also, as I said, the wrap was insensitive to the increase in uh, compaction effort. So this uh, graph here, uh, after we saw this, uh, in this graph here the densities, now we're comparing the stiffness of the different materials. And there's a lot of details in this graph here, but I'll try to simplify it a little bit. So uh, basically, the graph on the top here shows the uh, stiffness values uh, using the LWD. And the graph at the bottom here shows the stiffness values measured using a geo gauge. And each two consecutive uh, readings here are for the same material with two different uh, capping materials. So the first is the type G uh, dolomite capping material, and then the second is the type E capping uh, material for all the different uh, materials. So if you look at, uh, to start with, the LWD results, uh, there are three bars per material. Each bar represents the time of the LWD drops. So the first bar here is for uh, right after construction, then 24 hours after construction, and then seven days or a week from the construction. At one, what you can see for all the materials uh, in general is that uh, the modulus increases as uh, with the drying of uh, or the, the dry uh, uh, placement of the materials. So with time, the modulus increases. Two materials showed a very significant uh, increase in modulus with time, which are uh, this material, uh, the railroad gradation uh, version material with a type E uh, wrap uh, capping material. And the other material here is a type D material, which showed a very high increase in modulus. And this is the blend of the 40% uh, wrap with the 60% concrete. Another trend that was seen is that uh, for the materials constructed on CBR3, uh, uh, the wrap had the highest modulus while the uh, uh, larger size virgin aggregate material had lower uh, modulus. Now moving to the trends uh, shown for the geo gauge, uh, you can see first that there is higher variability for the wrap sections, for most of the sections, than the ones with the dolomite capping. Uh, you can also see that the overall, the average uh, stiffness measured for the wrap capping uh, sections was higher than the stiffness measured for the uh, um, dolomite capping material. Uh, just to summarize the main points, the LWD modulus increased along with the dry curing of the material, and there was a higher or much higher significant variability observed for the geo gauge modulus values than for the lightweight deflectometer 
modulus values. Now, after those uh, materials were put in situ, uh, there was an accelerated pavement testing study using uh, the accelerated transportation loading assembly atlas. And then there were uh, some rutting measurements for the different sections to get how much permanent deformation was accumulated in these sections. And those are summarized also in these slides. So I'll uh, try to uh, summarize the main points shown in these slides. So the top two slides here show the accumulation in uh, permanent deformation with different number of load applications for the construction platforms, for the CBR1 sections mm -hmm. here on the left, and for the CBR3 sections here on the right. Uh, the amount of, uh, or the loading repetitions were 4,000 loading repetitions for these sections. And uh, what happened here is that uh, all of the sections on the CBR1 uh, passed 4,000 loading repetitions before accumulating more than three inches of rutting, which is the failure criteria that we have, except for one of the sections, which is this section here, uh, that uh, failed after even less than 100 passes, accumulated more than three inches of rutting. And this section here is actually the section uh, with the railroad uh, size gradations with the wrap uh, capping that, if you remember, when I was mentioning here, it showed actually the highest uh, stiffness. But it was the only section that failed uh, before 4,000 4, passes. Um, for the sections on CBR1, uh, they all, uh, sorry, CBR3, they all uh, passed 4,000 passes without failing. And uh, also, uh, the number of passes to failure w uh, followed the LWD uh, modulus trends. Now, shown here at the bottom are the results for the HMA paved sections, or the low volume road applications, which are the same materials here, but uh, paved or topped with uh, four inches of HMA on top. Uh, what you can see here is that all uh, materials passed the uh, criteria for failure, which is 40,000 passes and accumulating less than half an inch of rutting, except one material here, which is uh, the material that had the uh, wrap uh, aggregate subgrade uh, material with a dolomite capping on the top. So uh, what this graph here shows is probably expected for the construction platforms. But if you see here, and if you compare the results between construction platforms and the HMA paved sections, and we're showing the uh, dolomite capped material with the empty fills and then the wrap capped material with the solid fills, what you see is that the trend was the opposite between the construction platforms and um, the HMA paved sections. So the sections that had uh, the dolomite capping, for example, rutted less in the construction platforms, but they showed more rutting in the uh, HMA paved sections, which is counterintuitive because you would expect those trends to be the same, except that the magnitudes of the rutting will be less because of the asphalt on the top. So uh, in order to explain this trend, uh, the research team had to go back and do some uh, pavement forensics and some investigations to see what was actually going on in those sections. And in order to do that, uh, they used some strength-based methods to actually uh, look into the pavements and the different layers and see what was going on underneath. So uh, what was used was uh, a DCP, which is the, the dynamic cone penetrometer, to get the strength profile uh, of the different uh, pavement sections, as well as another technique called the Panda technique or the Panda penetrometer, which is a very similar technique shown here on the right with the guy hammering the rod. And uh, basically what this does is uh, pretty much the same thing as the DCP, but it's a variable energy technique. So you vary the energy with each drop and then measure the cone resistance or the tip uh, of the cone uh, resistance as it's penetrating the pavement layers. Uh, what's also good about this technique is that after the hole is being done, you can actually put a small camera into um, uh, the hole and get uh, your uh, uh, like depth profile of the pavement see where the layer interfaces are, what's the thickness of each layer, as well as where the water table level is, so that eventually this might uh, actually help in uh, explain some uh, of the permanent deformation uh, trends. So this is uh, just uh, a summary slide showing the results of uh, uh, the cone resistance, which is by Panda, and then the CBR uh, by the DCP of the one of two of the sections, which is the type A sections. Um, and this is the railroad uh, size aggregate uh, capped with uh, dolomite, which is shown as uh, 
empty symbols and then capped with wrap, which is shown as the solid field symbols. And then these uh, values and how they change across the profile in the engineering subgrade and in the aggregate subgrade materials on top of it, as well as in the capping material. As you can see also on the left and the right, uh, you can also get uh, uh, some images uh, from different depths for which materials you have, where's the depth of the water table and stuff uh, like that. Uh, one thing to notice here is that, uh, if you remember, uh, for those uh, large aggregate materials, the CBR target uh, for the engineered subgrade was 1%. And what this eventually ended up, on average, being around 10% and not uh, 1% due to the penetration of the large rocks in these materials. As you see here, at a depth of uh, more than 24 inches, uh, you can see some of the large rocks penetrating the subgrade and increasing the uh, relative CBR value for those uh, weak subgrade materials. So this slide here uh, summarizes the results of the strength indices that were obtained for all the different test sections. The top two here are for the aggregate subgrade materials, and then the bottom two here are for the in-situ subgrade uh, material. Um, the top is the Panda, then DCP, and the same thing here, Panda and DCP. What you can see here is that usually the stiffness, uh, sorry, the strength trend is not uh, similar to the stiffness trend, which we showed before, where the wrap sections had higher, uh, uh, like significantly higher uh, stiffness in general. But you can see for the strength-based uh, method, uh, in most of the sections, it's either similar or a little bit lower for uh, wrap uh, capping than for the dolomite capping. Also, what you can see here for the subgrade is uh, for the CBR1 subgrade, which was a target CBR1 subgrade as shown by this dotted line here, the actual achieved values were more or less in the range of 10 uh, or higher CBR than the 1. While for the CBR3 subgrade, um, even though some were a little bit higher, like uh, the section with the wrap here, but uh, the other section was almost on target with a CBR 3%. Just to summarize the main points here, uh, so the subgrade strength indices follow the same trend uh, as the LWD modulus for the uh, CBR 3 uh, sections only, which are just these two sections at the end, but not the rest of the sections. And then the uniformly graded type A and type C materials Here's type A and uh, type C because they were uniformly graded. There were higher variation in the subgrade resistance values than the other uh, sections. And uh, there was a considerable gain in subgrade strength uh, in the large rock sections here that ended up being higher than the CBR1 uh, target because of the penetration of the large rocks into the uh, uh, weak subgrade. This slide here uh, shows uh, the water table uh, level. Uh, that was uh, uh, inspected or seen from the cameras that were lowered inside the pavement. And what you can see here is that uh, type A, this section here that we said that had the highest rotting and filled the earliest, while even though it had the highest modulus, we actually had the shallowest water table. So this is the top of the pavement, and we're going down uh, into the pavement as we go up on this scale. So it had the shallowest uh, water table here. Uh, which means that the modulus values might have been misleading because the water table was actually uh, really shallow in this section. While the section that rotted last, which is the 60% concrete, 40% uh, wrap blend, had the shallowest water table. So uh, the effect uh, of water table is actually seen here because of the buildup of uh, uh, pore water pressure, which increased the stresses on the pavement uh, as it's being <laughs> loaded when the water level is uh, shallow in the aggregate layers. Uh, what we see here also is the wrap section here, the, the one with the dolomite section, which we said uh, failed the earliest, actually had also the highest thickness. So even though it had uh, the highest uh, achieved thickness in the lab, it still failed uh, earlier than the other sections. Uh, and what this graph and the previous graphs uh, show is that they were able to explain uh, most of the trends in the rutting of the different sections, except for one thing, which is uh, what I was mentioning, that when we had the construction platforms, the wrap sections rutted the most, but then when we had them uh, topped with HMA, the dolomite capped sections showed more rutting. Uh, so the reason or the explanation behind that was uh, actually uh, uh, achieved by getting some uh, HMA cores from those sections and measuring the thickness of the achieved HMA um, layers. And this graph here, the 
uh, solid lines show the thickness of the binder cores, while the, uh, sorry, the solid uh, fills. While the empty field here uh, showed the thickness, uh, the total th thickness of the HMA uh, layer. The target is this dotted line at four inches. But what you can notice is that for each two consecutive sections here, which are the same material, different capping, dolomite, and then wrap, the wrap uh, material capping consistently for all the sections had higher HMA pavement thickness. So uh, what was actually happening, as you can see more clearly here, is that the sections that had the wrap cadding, capping, even though the target HMA thickness was around four inches, they ended up with five inches or slightly like in the range of uh, five inches for most of uh, the cores, while the sections who had the dolomite capping ended up to be uh, on target or slightly lower thicknesses than the ones with the wrap uh, thicknesses. So eventually, uh, the change in trend uh, was actually because of the higher thicknesses of the HMA layers. And this is the mo since HMA is the most stiff layer and it's the top layer, it was actually taking most of the load uh, and uh, reducing the rutting that was measured uh, in those sections uh, due to the higher thicknesses of the HMA in the wrap cap sections. So another uh, thing that was done as was actually to get the profile of the pavement or the elevations at the top of the aggregate layers, the top of the binder course, and the top of the surface course uh, of the uh, HMA and see uh, how these elevations change across the total uh, road from the beginning to the end with the different test sections. And what you can see here is that uh, for the sections that have wrap in them, like this section here with the 40% wrap, and this section here, which is the type E only wrap as the base course material, the elevations were consistently the lowest, and we have sag areas in these sections, while for the other sections, uh, the elevations are relatively smoother or even higher, such as that for type B. So um, the conclusion here from here is that uh, as the wrap percentage increase, the overall uh, uh, in, the, in the pavement, then the surface elevation decreased, indicating that there was sinkage uh, during the construction operation. So what the research team is suspecting is that uh, with the increase in wrap in those uh, sections and the high load from the paper, what was actually happening is that the wrap was consolidating and sinking, uh, which have uh, resulted in uh, higher uh, thicknesses of the HMA in those locations. Uh, talking about the conclusions from this study, uh, the first thing is that working platforms with large aggregate performed considerably well despite failing to meet, to meet the compaction requirements. As we've seen, most of them uh, passed the uh, failure criteria before failing. Uh, for the CBR3 uh, thick sections, the lightweight deflectometer measurements could be related to the rutting performance in the working platform sections, which wasn't the case for the CBR1 sections. Uh, if we have shallow water table, however, the strength-based approach is more preferable than modulus-based approach to evaluate the sections and get the rotting performance or the permanent, uh, permanent deformation performance of these sections. Um, uh, also comparing two stiffness methods, the geo gauge and the LWD, geo gauge may not be a feasible choice if large size aggregates are used in construction or unbound layers due to the high variability uh, in the results. And, uh, and the last thing is considering the higher rutting and sinkage potential for the wrap, then the use of wrap should be considered with caution. And if used, uh, it is actually better to uh, characterize the properties using a strength-based approach than a uh, uh, stiffness-based approach, as that can be misleading, as we've seen uh, higher uh, stiffness or modulus for the wrap sections than for uh, the other sections. Lastly, um, not advertising, but uh, my study will actually continue uh, the work uh, of uh, what Hassan Kazmi was doing. Uh, so we have, uh, we're now uh, um, evaluating the field performance of sustainable aggregate byproduct applications uh, to study the green applications of quarry byproducts uh, in a field testing study for uh, sustainable payment applications. So we've seen from Hassan's study that uh, we're moving to a larger aggregate size for aggregate subgrade material. And what we're actually trying to see now is what if we actually use finer materials, like increase the fines content with the quarry byproducts to um, accommodate more quarry byproducts in these sections, how will they behave? Or what if we increase the stability of the large rocks? Because these large rocks uh, with uniformly, uh, uniform gradation usually have low stability uh, by filling the voids with the quarry byproducts material, which I uh, presented uh, in the past, uh, some of those results. 
So thank you very much, and hope you enjoyed the presentation. Ah. Questions? probably 10 slides less in that event. <laughs> Still, some of the major slides like this, and others, he had to go through those. <laughs> that's, that's but I hope that you at least got the, the big picture from those. Uh, I tried to summarize them. I'll ask a big picture question here. Okay. I may have missed it at the very beginning. But what is IDAT's major motivation to go to blood drug aggregate based materials? Is it economy or not to staying away from more product with more fine particles? Yes, probably. To reduce the byproduct, maybe development. Or what is it? Probably <laughs> Professor Zuno can ask, answer yeah. this better, but I think it's an economy based approach because with those large drugs, they can use the primary, secondary crushers. They don't need to go to the tertiary crusher at the quarries, so they can end up eventually reducing the energy needed for producing those aggregates and also reducing the waste materials as far as that is okay. being produced. And also, uh, they perform well with very weak. Uh, CBR because they can penetrate inside the, the weak That's CBR. That's your study's findings. Yeah. Did, you, did you anticipate that at the beginning of the study? Anticipate what again? The, 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 the good performance of these large drugs, like penetrating into CBR. Each sure, drug, yeah. sure. But again, it, even in Hassan's project, this was anticipated. This was already known practice. So for many years, especially with the, our subcase oils, it, May, June, in the early July, whatever, that time frame getting really wet. More than 50% of the moist soils are usually on the wet side of optimum and have to construct in those soil soils. Right? The common practice has been dumping rocks because that's the cheaper thing to do. Okay, because you have, you have to otherwise build two feet of CA6 premium material. Now, there wasn't any kind of a research study, any kind of rule about you know, how to do this in practice in a, in a better way. Like, can we use all uniform material? Is there a stability issue? Can we use uh, maybe more kind of a large size, top size, but dense graded, or, or, or some other means? From the crusher's perspective, from the producer's, aggregate producer's perspective, it's always been, uh, well, primary crusher is great, we crush less, we generate even less fines, and why not? get these used in thicker lifts or immediately like on soft subways for construction platforms. That's and, and it, it was already used by the practice, practicing engineers. But there wasn't any guidance, there wasn't any uh, research study that validated yes, this is the right application or uh, not like this, but such and such properties of these large rocks to be used as such, you know, and how much of that now from recycled versus virgin, what kind of effect can we blend it to it? There were all kinds of questions, but all of those kind of were answered. And the biggest thing that we found was that, in, 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 even though it was a CBR1, right? Indeed, dumping these in, these large rocks, uh, caused a lot of penetration into those, you know, very soft subgroups. But, but eventually, the, all of them became, in all of those CBR, one test sections that you show two of those cells, right? Uh, CBR was around 10 as compared to the last cell which was designed for CBR3. And all of those, again, two cell test sections now perform better than even the CBR3 ones. So now there are some guidelines about how to do this, which one to use. And, and, and the winner was, I think you mentioned, the blend of the two, right? So by itself, RAB had a lot of sinkage issues on the uh, uh, capping material that he showed you. That's an issue. But when RAB is mixed with some of these large rocks, that was the crushed concrete application, 40 to 60 blend, it performed very well. 
but wrap by itself is a layer, there's a lot of rubbing and seepage. So a better way to use it than actually blending with those light ones. By itself, again, it's, it's rutting a lot, but it wasn't rutting, it was filling all the voids of the light rats. It worked very well. So uh, there are really key lessons to be learned here, and based on the lessons we learned, that especially the stability issue we observed from Hassan's work. We brought that knowledge into the next phase of the tests, uh, experiments, okay, designed, which became, again, his PhD work now, his son's work, where we can now use the QP in those. But RAP is another one, we can fill those words too, so, so those are all good applications. So this compaction problem that we have, uh, do you have any solution how to address that? Uh, actually, yes, in my test section, we were trying to compact everything at the optimum moisture content. And uh, in that case, we achieved higher than 100% uh, relative compaction. So moisture adjustment is also a key point in this. Uh, the stability of the platform, if you have uh, like more stable platform, less susceptible to, to sinkage, you can achieve higher compaction density. Because that density you achieve is not just a factor of the moisture content, but it's also a factor of how stiff is your platform that you compacting those materials on top of it. So you can actually use both solutions simultaneously to get better compaction results. As well as the compaction curve study that you actually achieve the highest compaction at what number of program passes with your compacted effort. So if in the subgrade is too, like uh, maybe a CBR1 subgrade, you might have still compaction problem. That's why you need to top that subgrade with aggregate material that is sufficient to get uh, good platform for the compaction of your base surface materials at all. Yeah, you know with the 95% uh, density compaction of dolomite you tried to achieve, you never achieved it, but something which I found interesting was that after 18 compactions, you achieve the highest density and then afterwards you achieve even the lower density. Yeah. Is that because you're basically end up, you end up compacting the layer below uh, the dolomite or is that just a standard uh, uh, quality actually, of the material? Why, why is that happening? Probably what started to happen after 18 passes is that the material started to crush more mm -hmm. and to reorient, like it crush and, and shift. So instead of getting compaction, you're getting uh, dislocation of the materials. That's why the density uh, started to decrease. Because in, in the lab, if you do a, a compactive effort in a mold, for example, the mold is confined. You have the walls of the mold, the stiff, the boundary. So you get compaction increase or density increasing with a compacted effort, but in the field, this material can dislocate to the sides, so you can get uh, dislocation of the material. Isn't it also confined by the other material around it? Uh, to an extent, yes, but still, you have a, like, the, your boundaries are actually larger in the field. You don't have a very small uh, control. I believe that's the main reason. I don't know if you can focus on that. Uh, I was writing an email, I'm sorry. He was asking uh, why F, the compaction growth curve here, after 18 roller passes, the density started to decrease again. Oh, yeah, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, that's the field uh, uh, check of the uh, density growth curve, basically, how you experiment with it and see what happens. Uh, you can squeeze things with number of passes back and forth to the optimum packing, right? But if you keep passing, with, going back with the roller, the roller passes back and forth, what you do now by squeezing more with more energy now, the densest packing, you're spoiling that now, and individual particles starts to climb over each other, and now they become loser in the state that actually you decrease the density. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, so, over-compacting, they call it. And they go back up again. You never know. Continue. Yeah. So, that's why usually there's a uh, test section that you study this and then you, you know exactly how many passes to apply. That's exactly what Hassan was studying there in the project. Actually, to understand what can be achieved, what, can, what could be achieved, uh, achieved at that time, and he was trying to get to that number of passes with every uh, other application. So it's a property of all unbound materials? It's a property of all materials in general. It would apply to asphalt concrete problems. Yeah. yeah. You never go there because you know, usually asphalt concrete becomes too stiff yeah. and they cannot 
structure can additionally cannot and then you cannot densify anymore. But if you continue adding compaction, you may you may also <laughs> destabilize as well concrete as well. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. Eighty to ninety to ninety-five percent of that also is negligence, right? Eventually, if you get especially some certain mixes, coarse, coarse, coarse is in. Good, good discussion. All right. I think you said one. You see that? It's not perfect.